coming up on the payoff. Recently, I've had the opportunity to go to AA meetings in Austin and be around this gentleman we're about to hear from now. He is 90 years old, more than 30 years sober, a fighter pilot, uh, flew 159 missions in Vietnam. And a guy like that who flies those life or death missions talks to us about how alcoholism and getting sober is life or death. Now, if you didn't know it before, hearing it from a guy like that, for me, just makes it all the more impactful. He is funny. Uh, as you could imagine, there are wisdom and stories galore. And I would urge you on this holiday weekend to take time and listen to this, whether you need help to stop drinking or you need help with your attitude, which I think we all do at, at one point or another. This is the podcast for you. Colonel Dan, this guy, he would deny it, but he is a legend. Uh, he is a legend on many levels, and I am so happy to share this time with Colonel Dan with you. Uh, speaking of legends, in his own mind, in our mind, in everybody's mind, Kevin Souza. Yes, sir. Good morning. Colonel Dan. Yes, sir. You notice how I'm early. That's that's Navy time. <laughs> I, had, I had an x-ray at 8 o'clock this morning in the doctor's office, so I got there and got back quick. Well, you're pretty – I mean, you're, you're – so how uh, how old are you now, 90? I'll be 91 in January. And you're still moving around pretty good. I'm still driving. I'm still walking, and I'm still breathing, Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, this is uh, the only other person. It's going to be myself and then Mike. Say hi. This is Mike, the producer. Hello. Mike, how are you today? So, Colonel Dan, we'll just get started, if you don't mind. We'll just talk, you know, talk about what we talk about, uh, talk about your experience. And, uh, you know, you have a very interesting life. I was talking with uh, our buddy Mark. He said you were you were raised in, in, I guess you were born in Dallas. I was born in Dallas, 1931. Uh, January the 14th, uh, to a father uh, during the Depression. Uh, my dad was a house painter, but he had kept work during the Depression working for a banker painting houses that were repossessed and trying to resell them. So we we had bread and uh, on the table and clothes on our back, and but we were still, I was thought to be extremely frugal all my life. Uh, my mother taught me a few good things. She said, son, the first penny you make goes to the church. The second penny you make goes into savings. And the third penny you make, you spend the way you want to spend it. So I've kind of practiced that all my life, and it's paid off for me. So you had some, you, you had a solid upbringing. You had, you had parents who taught you, the, the, I guess, quote, unquote, the right way to live. I had magnificent parents. My mother had never had a drink of alcohol in her life. Uh, she never flew in an airplane. Uh, she died when I was a freshman at Texas A&M College. I was 17 years old, and it was very devastating to me. But how, I did how, did she, a, how did she die, Colonel? She died of a heart attack. Okay. I'd been down at A&M too much. But I had two very important things happen to me growing up that I want to point out. One I was nine years old, and I had my tonsils out, and I had a dream when I was under the anesthesia, and I dreamt that there was a wire attached to my right index finger, and it went up into heaven, and at the end of that wire was God, and God laid down at me, and he said, if you believe in me, I'll slide good things down to you on this wire all your life, and I've kind of lived a charmed life, and I've gone through life with God sliding good things down to me. Uh, you know, I've had tragedy in my life, but uh, as a rule, I've had a good attitude, and uh, I just sit here accepting things. As an example, I went to middle school. It was called junior high in those days, and <laughs> I was elected the most popular boy in school. Went to high school and uh, played varsity football as a freshman, and was I was all city football player in Dallas, and. Uh, I uh, voted the most popular underclass boy, the most popular senior boy, and I don't know how all these things happen. They just seem to happen, and uh, I just had a charmed life. Let me ask you something. When you, because we talk about the alcoholic sometimes, 
uh, there's a sense of entitlement. Did you get used to all these good things happening to you and almost expect them? I mean, I know you worked very hard from the very beginning. I know you were a painter as a kid and you always earned your way, like your mother said. But were you? did you get that sense of entitlement almost? Almost entitled. I certainly did. As a matter of fact, I became conceited, <laughs> expecting good things to happen. I uh, went off to NM and uh, with some gr- great friends and was in the Air Force ROTC. And as uh, I, said, I said, two things happened to me as a kid. The second thing I want to point out, I was 12 years old. I'd built every model of every airplane a kid could build. My room was full. My bedroom was full of model airplanes. But I'd never touched one. And I jumped on my bike at age 12 and went out to an airport called Hampton Airport, south of Dallas, to touch an airplane. And the steerman came in, a steerman airplane by wing, two, two wings, open cockpit. And a guy was putting air gas in it, and I was touching the trailing edge of that wing. And he looked down at me, and he said, are you a pilot? And I said, I'm only 12. <laughs> and he said, have you ever flown? And he said, I said, no, sir. He said, do you want to fly? And I said, I got a dollar ninety-one cents. I was going to buy a model airplane with, but that's all I've got. He said, that'll do. <laughs> I gave him the dollar ninety-one. He strapped me in, started it up, and we took off. And I can sit in this chair I'm in right now and look down and close my eyes and see that wheel lift off the ground. And I kind of knew I wanted to fly all my life from age twelve on. What was more intoxicating for you, that first flight? Uh, as a, even as a passenger, or the, your your first drink. Oh well, my drinking career was a little different. Uh, my flying was the most important thing in my life. Uh, I went into pilot training, and my flight instructor uh, said, "Danny said you're a natural." He said, "I'm going to make you the best fighter pilot in the Air Force." He said, "I also went to the officers' club Friday night for happy hour." He said, "I'm going to teach you how to drink like one." <laughs> And that first Friday night in the Air Force, I fell in love with flying that week. I fell in love with a happy hour, and I fell in love with dry martinis. <laughs> and with you, with being a fighter pilot, there's, like you said, there's a certain will. Uh, you know, I want to go back, actually. You talked about, as a kid, you, you put together model airplanes. Anybody that's ever done that, uh, which I have not done it, but my brother, my older brother used to do it. The attention to detail uh, is unbelievable. And you yeah. clearly you had an attention to detail growing up and a strong will. Uh, Was there a point when you started to drink where, I mean, when you started to drink at that that officer's club and the dry martinis, did you feel like you had control over it? Well, every Friday night for the next 30 years, uh, I was at the officer's club with happy hour. And my wife usually joined me. And Saturday night, we would go have dinner at the club. And it was a very social life, but uh, when I came into AA, I told my daughter I was in AA, and she said, "Well, Dan, you're not a dad. You're not an alcoholic." And I said, "Well, what do you think I was doing up there on Friday night at happy hour?" And she said, "Well, Dad, everybody did that, and everybody did it, but they didn't do it the way I did it." But you know, you probably—I lived on the airbase most of the time, and we never got in trouble driving home, never got DUIs, never got in fights. So I never had anything like that in my life. I just drank on the weekends and flew during the week. So I wouldn't consider myself an alcoholic if that does, if that makes sense. But when I retired, I got a stockbroker's license and I went into the wholesale side of securities and I was teaching brokers how to sell uh, product. I worked for public storage. They had an investment and I toted that to the brokers. Those PSA uh, uh, buildings you see on the side of the road for storage, right? Right. Yeah. The orange doors. Yep. So PSI. PSI. Great investment back in those days. And uh, this was 1983. And my boss called me and said, Dan, I want you to treat your brokers to a happy hour and they'll sell your your product. So my first week, <laughs> that next week, I went up to St. Louis, Missouri and invited the Smith Barney office over at the Hyatt Hotel for happy hour. And paid a liquor bill at the end of two hours of seven hundred and thirty dollars. Now this is back in nineteen eighty three. It's a lot of money. I expensed it and put my boss called me the next week and said, Dan, I want you to do that. Said uh, that's exactly what I want you to do. And my God, I thought I'd died and gone to heaven. You know, free booze, free alcohol, and I came out of the closet and uh, 
the next seven years, I didn't draw a sober breath. So you were drinking almost around the clock? Well, no, I wasn't drunk around the clock. I put on financial seminars for 300 people, and uh, brokers would come up and say, Dan, that's the best seminar I've ever heard. You were so funny. Well, my God, I was half smashed. (laughs) Did you think it was almost a superpower for a little bit, the alcohol? Because I know that early on in my drinking, or at least what I consider my effective drinking years, uh, which I probably, they probably weren't, but I, I felt like it gave me courage, it gave me enthusiasm, and it gave me personality. Did you have those feelings at all? I think every alcohol does, Steve. I think every alcoholic has that. Uh, my selfishness, my self-centeredness, my controlling. You know, when you're in a jet fighter by yourself, you're in total control. And uh, I kind of carried that into my life, and uh, that was bad. Uh, it ended up in a divorce. Uh, I'd been in a six years and divorced after a very long marriage. But I got to the point where I just... Uh, I was disgusted with myself. I didn't like who I was. And I think I drank, and this may sound silly, I, I think I drank because I was covering up my character defects. I realized I wasn't a good person. I realized I was a controller. I realized I uh, was doing things I shouldn't be doing, uh, cheating on my wife, things like that. I had every opportunity in the world to do that. And uh, on January the 19th, 1990, I woke up in a hotel room in Dallas, Texas, drunk, hungover, in a filthy room, and uh, wanted to kill myself. And I drove back to Austin, and uh, I remember I walked into my bar, and uh, I put my hands on the bar, and I said, God, I've got a problem. I quit. I'll never drink again. And I walked through my dining room and it flashed through my mind. And it's, this has happened to every alcoholic, I think. My mind said, Dan, let's have one drink tonight and we'll quit tomorrow. <laughs> and I went into the refrigerator. I was putting ice in a glass. And thank God, my wife walked up to me and she said, what are you doing? I said, I'm fixing a drink. And she said, you're a dirty drunk. You smell like puke. I'm just very disgusted with you. And I went into the, uh, my office and looked up AA in the Yellow Pages, and I called them and said, now this, is, this is how stupid I was. The guy said, this is uh, awesome in the AA. Okay, how can I help you? And I said, I've got a friend that has a drinking problem. <laughs> I said, he's, he's got a lovely home out in northwest Austin. He has a lake house up on Lake Travis at Lago Vista. He has an airplane. He's got everything in the world, but uh, he can't stop drinking. So he, I don't think he's an alcoholic with all those things. But And this guy, he said, sir, he said, there's a meeting in uh, 35 minutes at Far West Boulevard, 5365. Now, I remember that from 30, 32 years ago. And then, excuse me for what I'm about to say, but he said, you better hurry up and get your drunk ass up there. <laughs> you can't be ass an alcoholic. He saw right through me, and uh, I went to my first day in it. You know, for somebody like you that was, and, and you are, you know, I've been around you, you're articulate, you're handsome, I, you know, you're a great athlete. Here you are, a, a fighter pilot. Uh, you flew F-4s. The guy, you're in the front seat in total control of everything, life or death. And then you've, you've got to flip through the phone book uh, and, and look for AA. What, what, is that, what is that feeling like? Well, that's before cell phones, you know. Uh-huh. Yeah, you, you had to go to a phone book, which they don't even make anymore. And that's the only place I knew to find AA, and they were listed in the yellow pages. How? But you know that? I'm sorry. Go no, ahead. no, you go ahead. You go ahead. That 30 year career in the Air Force was uh, so much fun. I can't describe it, other than saying my kids were born in three years in Japan. We were there three years, and. I was transferred to England, and they went to the first three years of school in England, and we graduated from high school in Italy, and I lived in Hawaii for five years in the military and one year in Vietnam. So I flew 159 combat missions in Vietnam in F-4s, and that was interesting because I got shot at by everything the North Vietnamese had in their inventory and never got hit. But I lost three friends over there and that were shot down, and I had two friends end up in the Hanoi Hilton as prisoners of war that eventually got out after six years. So um, 
I think the biggest tragedy in my life was uh, two weeks before I came home, I got a Dear John letter from my wife saying she had met another guy and was divorcing me and marrying him. While you were in Vietnam? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I flew my last month and came home and uh, I landed in Sacramento and we, they put us on a bus to take us to an airport in uh, San Francisco and we came out of the main gate of the airport and they were throwing eggs and tomatoes at us and there was a sign up that said baby killers. Jeez. And here I just lost some friends and Blind combat, and I just got a dear John letter, and I was, I was not a very happy person. What do you do, somebody like you that's got, you know, this this fierce determination and will, and, uh, you know, you just fought for your country, and, and you're at this low point after all that. Do you just keep going with your career, with being a fighter pilot? Do you just move on to the next thing? Because clearly you had more success in your career. You continue to evolve uh, with well, as, a, as a pilot. I think my whole personality changed when that happened because I came back to Dallas. My mother had been dead for years and my father was in the hospital and I was holding his right hand when he passed away. And uh, that's a pretty big bottom to hit. Your father dying, your wife divorcing, you taking your kids and and she took everything we owned and I paid child support and I was, I was pretty bitter. But I'd just been promoted to lieutenant colonel and I came to Berkstrom Air Force Base here in Austin, and I was assigned as a squadron commander of one of the F-4 squadrons. That's a big deal. That's the best job you can have in the Air Force. You've got about 400, 500 people working for you, and you've got 18 airplanes, all these pilots and navigators, and you're responsible for all of it. It was a great, great job, but my personality changed. Uh, I hate to say this, but I hated women. I didn't trust any women at all, and uh here I am, a lieutenant colonel, right out of combat, and and uh, every wife in the squadron of uh, the pilots were trying to get me married to their mother, their sister, their cousin, their sorority sisters, and I'd meet them on Friday and live with them a week and then dump them, and yeah. that's just not a way to live your life. That 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 hurt maybe brought on right by by that divorce and and by your wife leaving oh. you. You turn it into promiscuity and acting fearless and like you're tough, but we're not. No doubt about it. I uh, I just didn't trust women. I, I thought they were evil. And I used them for quite a while until I finally met a, a woman and we got married. And that married lasted, marriage lasted 27 years. I came into AA and she wouldn't quit drinking. She kept drinking. And after six years in AA, I asked her for a divorce. You So you, so, and, and she was the one that told you that you were a dirty drunk? Yeah. Uh huh. She she literally saved my life, and then again, uh, I didn't trust her. But uh, I've been in a six years when I asked for that divorce because she would not quit drinking, and I couldn't live with someone that was drinking. I just I couldn't do it. Where'd you find the power to do that? I don't know. I don't know. Uh, I found out she was having an affair, and uh, that gave me the courage to do it. And uh, she was a very beautiful woman, a very lovely woman. Uh, but she had problems that I never addressed. And I, one of my biggest regrets in my life is not helping her when she needed help. And, uh, but I was single for six years. And uh, this is kind of a funny story. One day I sat down and I, excuse me for saying again what I'm about to say, but I said this when I talked to Citywide uh few years ago in my talk and I said my ideal woman was a long legged round bottom big breasted cheek twisting nymphomaniac that owned a liquor store. <laughs> and then one day I sat down and I said, God make me a man that a woman with character, honesty, integrity, decency would want to be with. And my wife walked right into my life. She was a member of my Sunday school class. And we've been married now 18 years, and it's the happiest marriage in the world. Oh, yeah, that's a, that's a beautiful thing. And that's kind of, did you find yourself acting yourself into that relationship? I mean, you ask God for the strength, but then you gotta, you, you, you've got to bring the shovel. No, he hit me like a ton of lightning. And uh, he, I felt like my whole life changed at that moment. And uh, AA has helped me change. Uh, I believe uh, you can't keep the AA program unless you give it away. 
over the years, I've sponsored probably 50 men. And when someone asks me to sponsor them, I, the first thing I say is, you just gave me the authority to take your inventory if I see a need to do it. Half of those guys have walked away, and half of them have stuck with me. I'm currently sponsoring six guys. I've sponsored one for 28 years. I've sponsored one for 16 years, and I've sponsored one guy that has three more years sobriety than I do. So I've got a variety of – I've got a, a newcomer. I've got a guy with less than a year of sobriety I'm sponsoring. Well, you're always – you know, I, I go to meetings, and you're always there. And that, to me, is such an attractive thing, and it comes through in your personality. What's one of the more important – what's what's kept you coming back, I guess? Coincidence. Uh, I came into January the 19th, 1990, and I was working with public, public storage. I'd been with them about eight years, and I'm at a meeting out in Los Angeles. And the owner of public storage says, we're doing away with your capital marketing group. We're going to have two guys go to big, like Texas uh, – Teachers Credit Union, and they'll donate a hundred hundred million dollars instead of you guys out there getting ten, fifteen thousand dollars at a whack. And we'll help you guys get jobs if you want them. And I punched the personnel director, and I said, "When am I totally uh, invested in our retirement program here?" And he looked into some paperwork. And he said, "Last month." And I said, "I quit." So <laughs> I haven't worked since January of uh, no April of nineteen ninety one. So I'd been in a, a, a year, a little over a year, and I quit working, and I had the opportunity to go to a meeting every day. How important is that for people that have that free time? I, I, I try to talk to people. I mean, you, maybe a newcomer bottoms out and comes around. It's like, hey, you've got the gift of unemployment. You have that time. There's nothing like filling your schedule with, with AA, in my opinion. Well, it's not a schedule. AA is a way of life. Uh, I've said in many meetings, you only have to do two things in AA. That's don't drink and change your whole life. And I don't say that to be funny. Uh, it's the truth. AA is the way of life. You have to change. And uh, I had three days. I went to a Friday night meeting, a Saturday meeting, a Sunday meeting, and I started detoxing, and I was shaking. I went to an FAA meeting room on at 4.30 on Sunday afternoon and said, God, I surrender. And when I said that, I meant that with all my heart, soul, and I quit shaking, and uh, I said, God, I'll do anything anybody tells me to do. So Monday, the very next day, with four meetings in my, under my belt, I asked God to sponsor me, and I said, tell me what to do. And he told me, and I've been doing it for 32 years. How unlike you, the, the, the fighter pilot, was that, to ask a guy, and you, you mentioned it, you used the word coachable. To become coachable, how different was that from the way you were wired coming in? Well, I asked God to change me. You know, when when I said I surrender, you're you're not giving up anything. You're just saying I'm willing to change my life because it's not working. You're, the, the alcoholic's life is not working. It's unmanageable. And uh, I just changed. And uh, I, I made the decision I, to check this. When you surrender, you have to surrender. And when you do, you're just giving up your the old life and learning to live a new life. And it's so to me, it's so simple. When you surrender, you become teachable. And I think you have to be teachable to change because you have to change. Let me ask you something. I don't know if you're sitting down or not, but here's what: don't don't get any older sitting in that chair. Well, you can't stop it. You're going to get older. You can't stop change. Change can either be good or change can be bad, in my opinion. So I started changing my life, the way I think, the way I act, the way I treat people, and the way I live my life. And it's I love what I'm doing right now. And I love my getting up in the morning and feeling good and happily married and healthy. I've got a little prayer. I, I say this prayer before I get out of bed every morning. I will not get out of bed till I say it. I say, good morning, God. I hope you and Jesus got some rest last night. I don't know what your plans are today, but please let my wife and I be part of it. And then I got this prayer from a guy who I'll tell you about in just a second. I said, God, take me where you want me to go. Let me meet who you want me to meet. Let me say what you want me to say. Then let me get out of the way. And that's the way I live my life. 
And I've got a photograph of a man in a newspaper called Father Judd. He was the chaplain for the New York City Fire Department during 9-11. He was killed when one of the towers collapsed, and four firefighters brought him out of the building, and uh, a picture was in the paper. And I found out that he had been a member of AA in New York City for years, and he said that prayer at every meeting. And I'm being teachable. I picked it up, and I, I say it every day. You're you're 91, and you keep a journal. Uh, oh yeah, yeah. Journal. What's what's in oh. that journal? Well, you open it up, and the first page are the pictures of six men who are dead that I've known in AA that died with long-term sobriety that were friends. And then, uh, excuse me, just a second. I'm going to get up. Yeah, take your time. Going to my den. Yeah, I got nothing but time for you. Okay, I'm going to get that journal just a second. Yeah, take your time. Because there's one thing I want to read out of it, and uh, yeah, I've, I've, I've heard you, I've heard you talk about that, and uh, you know, I look at you as a guy like, man, what's what's this guy need to journal for? It looks like he has it all, <laughs> but, but no, really. But then I start to think, well, maybe that's why he has it all, because he's doing the extra, no, he's I, doing the extra work. I only have a journal for one reason. So I don't forget. I don't forget things. If I have a meditation that's very meaningful to me, I will read it. I will post it. I will make a print of it, and I'll put it in my journal. And here's the cover of my journal. And I have something on the very front page that I will not and do not want to forget. This is very important to me. It says, a spiritual person needs to be careful. The more confident we are, the more likely our egos will get us into trouble. It's relatively easy to become self-righteous. We start to think we are teachers and others are students. We start to judge others. We start very suddenly at first to play God. After a while, we're really good at it. This is very dangerous. We need to remind ourselves we're here to do God's will. We need to pray every morning. Each day we need to check in with God to see what he would have us do. At night we need to spend time with God and review our day. By doing these things, we will stay on track. My creator, guide my path, and show me how to correct my life. I read that every day so that I don't get conceited, arrogant, and think I know everything. Yeah, that's pretty incredible. And then the first thing... Well, I have these pictures of these guys. Uh, Those are guys who you kind of, who are sober men, uh, who you worked with, right, in sobriety, and who had a, b a big impact on you. Yeah, I've got that one. Oh, there's six of them here. The biggest impact was Ed Mutum. I'm standing by the side of him at a Crested Butte AA conference in Colorado. Ed was six foot ten, 360 pounds, and he set up a schedule for the Harlem Globe Globetrotters. Oh. He was one. He was one of our speakers, and he and I were talking one day, sitting on the couch in the hospitality room, and became good friends. When I came home, he sent me an email, and that email changed my life, the way he signed it. What did it say? He said, he said Dan, I love you, and there's absolutely nothing you can do about it. <laughs> when he said that, I realized that that's God's love. He loves me, and there's absolutely nothing I can do about it. And if even I rejected, it's still there. So that kind of changed my life. Who that else is in there? Well, here's one of the first things. This is a, out of the Hazleton 24-hour day book. On the 1st of August, I'm headed to Crested Butte, Colorado, to that week-long AA conference. This is from 1992. And I read the devotion, and it says, There is no bond of union on earth compared with the union between a human soul and God. Priceless beyond all earth's reward is that union, in merging your heart and mind with the heart and mind of a higher power, a oneness of purpose results, which only those who experience it can even dimly realize. That oneness of purpose puts you in harmony with God and with all others who are trying to do His will. I read that the first of August, 1992, and I said, "Okay, that's what I want out of life," and uh, I, I try to do it. And it's so funny, I got out to Crested Butte and I went out to the morning meeting out on the deck at the foot of Mount, at Mount Crested Butte, beautiful scenery. 
And I walked into the meeting, and a guy said, who are you? And I said, I'm Dan from Austin. He said, Dan, what's on your mind? And I, I told him that that had just happened to me the day before. And I looked up, and there were about 80 men with tears in their eyes. <laughs> and one guy said, well, I didn't. I read that, but I didn't get that out of it. And all of a sudden, that became the subject of that meeting that day. Now, I go to, I've go to. i been to Christian View 28 times to that conference, not the last two years because of COVID. Mm-hmm. But two years after that, in 1993, a guy walked up to me and he said, Dan, would you come to the hospitality room? I need to talk to you. And I said, sure. He told me his name. He told me he was from Phoenix. And I said, what's on your mind? He said, I want to thank you for saving my life. And I said, what are you talking about? I don't even know you. He said, two years ago, when you remember reading that out on the deck? And I said, yeah. He said, I decided I wanted that in my life. And I had a gun up in my room. I was going to blow my brains out that day. So it dawned on me, you never know how God uses you. That wasn't me. I was just a conduit for God and saved a guy's life. And sometimes, Colonel Dan, like what I get from that is that you don't even know sometimes the impact, the positive impact you're having on people. Uh, you never know. Yeah, you, you don't know. Because how often is a guy going to track you down and actually tell you that? This episode is brought to you by Bill. You dug through your folders questioned the receptionist, emailed your boss, and it's official. You've stumbled upon another missing invoice mystery. Instead of putting on your detective's hat, go digital with Bill. Everything is stored and time-stamped online, so you never lose another invoice or payment again. Request a demo today at bill.com slash Spotify. This episode is brought to you by Shopify. That's the sound of another sale on Shopify. The moment a business dream becomes reality. Shopify is the commerce platform revolutionizing millions of businesses worldwide. They simplify selling online and in person and provide 24-7 support so you can focus on successfully growing your business. Sign up for a $1 per month trial period at shopify.com slash offer 22, all lowercase. Well, a guy tracked me down last Saturday at a meeting. He said, Dan, I, I brought you up in a meeting the other day quoting you what you said, and I, he told me what I'd said. Hell, I don't even remember saying it. <laughs> yes. <So. laughs> anyway, this, this journal, I've got things I've heard in AA meetings over the years, and it says, you know, like uh, everything you think does not have to come out of your mouth. Someone said that in the meeting, and that impressed me. And it says, here's a little note that says, to change what's going on around you, you have to change what's going on inside of you. Mm. And one year guy said, if I die tonight, I'll have, I'll have enough money to last me the rest of my life. And just little things like that. And uh, I don't want to forget these things. I can tell you're smiling right now. What, you know, <laughs> a lot of people come into AA or get sober and they think, I'm not going to be able to have fun anymore. Or I'm not going to be able to have, you know, my personality anymore. How, how was that debunked in your life? How quickly did you start to loosen up? When you came around, I can't tell you. It's just a matter of time, over time. It didn't happen overnight. It wasn't a bolt of lightning, though that detoxing was a bolt of lightning. God took that right out of me that third day when I went in and surrendered. And uh, there's this little things. That, here's one God is good, good is God. If it's not good, it's not a God. Uh, that's very important to me. And uh, just, I, I've, got a, I've got a hundred of these things I've heard in AA meetings. Here's a good one. If you're if you're alone, you can't be lonely. If you like the person you're alone with, you know. I don't. When I say things today, a meeting, I've never said anything original in my life. <laughs> yeah. Never, never quoted. Yeah, that's except what. Yeah, one, that's what I tell people too. Except one thing, uh, I think it's original. My prayer. I've got a five word prayer that I lose. I love, and that prayer is God. I need your help. And that's just an all-encompassing prayer. I think of that as, I don't know what help I need. I let him decide what help I need. And uh, I think of it as hitting a tennis ball over the net. When it gets to the other side of the court, it's his ball, and he does what he wants to with it. I just say, God, I need my, I need your help. And if I've got a newcomer and I'm talking to, I'll say, I'll try that prayer and only use it a few times the first day. I have to just use it about three or 400 times, and then, <laughs> then you 
used to it, and after a while, you'll start using it all, all the time. <laughs> I want to. I want to ask you in, in in January on the nineteenth, you'll have thirty two years. Okay, right, God willing, yep. as we say, you have a, lived quite a life. Um, in sobriety, you mentioned six years into sobriety, you, you you get divorced. I mean, that is real life stuff. To, to, that's stuff that I used to have to get drunk to do, you know, to have the self-esteem and the courage to do that. What kind of tragedy have you been through in sobriety? Uh, just some of the bigger things, and how have you gotten through it? Well, I was diagnosed with prostate cancer in 1995. I had surgery. In 2007, uh, I had open heart surgery. Open heart surgery. I had double bypass. Uh, I'm just now healing. Uh, I had an infection in my left. When I retired from the Air Force, I was diagnosed as a onset diabetes, and I've kept my weight down. I exercise day uh, five days a week. I don't eat sugar, but neuropathy gets into my legs, and you can't stop it from diabetes. And I had an infection four months ago in my left foot and they took an MRI and said, we have to remove the end of your big toe. So I went into surgery and they took the big toe off or the end of it. And the first time I looked at it, I said, I'm, I'm going to give you a name. And I call him Shorty. <laughs> he's, just, he's just kind of a nub. And then that infection went over to my little toe. And uh, uh, four weeks ago, I had my little toe on my left foot removed, amputated. So I've got the end of a big toe and a little toe missing, but I've got my balance and uh, I walk with a cane, but I've gotten through that. And uh, I don't know how many times I've said, God, I need your help. But just this morning, I was looking at my left foot. It looks a little weird, but I've got balance and, uh, and it's healing and that's great. And I, I had trouble getting a blood flow to my leg from diabetes and neuropathy and it's they finally got down there and they did the surgery and now I'm healing. So I'm on the mend. How do you? I honestly, I honestly believe with all my heart and soul, a person has 100% control of his attitude. I think we can stop our day anytime we want to and start over again by changing our attitude. And my journal is full of things about attitude. I'm reading one now. One of the greatest discoveries of my life is that I can alter my life by altering my attitude. A guy gave me a, a had that little thing saying framed, and it's right here in front of me when I looked up off my desk. How important is the regimen of, uh, you know, uh, basically practicing these these things in your life? Uh, you know, because people, some people, hey, you go to a meeting, I feel good, it's temporary relief, and but the permanent relief, right? Like you talk about that in meetings sometimes. You you're happy outside of meetings, right? You're happy when you go to the grocery store, or or you're working towards that, right? Because you live, like you said, it's a way of life. Well, let me ask you a question. You're in AA, right? Have you done the steps? Yes. Have you done all of them? Yes. You're doing the 12 steps, you're not doing it. If you're not practicing it in all your life, then you're not doing the steps. Yeah. But, you know, the steps, I do not work the steps. I live the steps there in my life. That's, that's, I do step 11, 10, 11, and 12 every day, and I've only done the other steps just once. You know, step, and, and here's how I grow in this program and learn. I just really realized what step three says. I've always said in AA meetings, step three says make a decision to turn your will and your life with the care of God. It doesn't say do it because you can't come into AA and be there two or three weeks and turn your will and your life over the care of God. You don't know how. You have to do step four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and do those steps, and it changes you, and you learn how to do it. But just the other day, it realized, I realized something. It says make a decision to turn our will and our life. I hadn't even thought about that. Turn our life over to the care of God. Not just our will, but our whole life. Oh, well, so I'm, I'm going to I'm, I'm let him run my life. I'm going to let him run it. And, and I, I got I, I got to go back to this guy who was a fighter pilot risking <laughs> li risking life and death. And I, and I want to just real quickly go back into, into Vietnam. When, when you were... When you were flying fighter pilots, you said 159 missions uh, in, in Vietnam. What was it? Can you convey what that 
what that is like to somebody? You'd have to see me for me to do it correctly because the first time I flew through any aircraft fire and I saw it coming off the ground at me, I had my right hand on the flight control stick and I put my left hand up in front of my eyes. I don't know why they, I thought that would protect me, but I guess it did. <laughs> if I, I look at it back now, I think I'll, even then I thought that's the, that's the dumbest thing you've ever done in your life. But it's the most human. It's the most human reaction, and it shows. It is the most, it is the most human reaction. <laughs> and uh, on the eleventh, let's see, the eleventh day of August, nineteen fifty-nine, I'm living up in Japan, and I'm northern Japan. I'm flying an airplane called an F one hundred and one Voodoo. It's a single seat, twin engine reconnaissance aircraft. Very, very fast airplane. And uh, I had to use just a long story, but I'm going to make it real short. Go ahead. I had I was coming in on a tanker to air refuel, just practice, and I had a utility hydraulic failure. And I declared an emergency, headed back toward the airport, Masawa Air Base, and I told them I had lost utility. And they, they, I realized I wouldn't be able I had to use the emergency system to put my landing gear down. I wasn't going to have any landing gear flaps. Probably wasn't going to have any brakes, and it was a very, but I still had flight control. And, uh, <laughs> excuse me, the, uh, I had the squadron ops officer on, on the radio, and they had the factory, McDonnell Douglas, trying to figure out what to do. And I blew the gear down on the air system instead of hydraulic system, and the nose gear popped out of the well, didn't come down. The left gear came down and locked, and the right gear stayed up and locked. So at this point, you're going down. At this, this point, I'm going to have to eject. Okay. And I can't land it. So I had, for 45 minutes, I, I flew around burning my fuel down and trying to figure out what to do. And the only, the only time I was really scared in an airplane, and I was scared to death, uh, Masawa was uh, nine-tenths of a mile from the northern Pacific Ocean, which was probably about 50 degrees, and you couldn't live in it if you ejected in it. This is up in northern Japan, near Sakhalin. Anyway, uh, I called the control tower, and I said, I'm headed toward the beach, and when the beach passes underneath me, I'm going to eject. I thought if, uh, I'd have ejected, the wind would come off the beach, blow my parachute back over land, and the airplane would hit in the ocean, and no one would get hurt. And that dumb control tower operator, I wanted to kill him. He said, Roger, good luck. And he <laughs> said that, I thought, Holy mackerel! You mean <laughs> you it happened to me? And I headed the airplane toward the ocean and ducked my head down, pulled the armrest up, and the canopy blew off. And it exposes triggers for you to squeeze and eject and fire yourself out of that airplane. I set real erect, straight up. I squeezed the triggers, and nothing happened. <laughs> and my, my first thought was, "You're dead, man. You're not going to live." And then I bent over to see what was wrong. And excuse my language again, but when I let over to look down, that thing fired, and my head was slammed down as it blew me out of the airplane. <laughs> and I say, I said this in a telling my story one time. That's the only time in my life I've been in a position where I could kiss my own ass. <laughs> <laughs> but the, the parachute opened. The airplane made a 180-degree turn, came back, and headed toward me, and I thought, man, this is not my day. <laughs> but God took care of me. The airplane rolled over, went in, and hit a telephone pole that was attached to a school that had 1,200 kids in it. Oh. It hit in, the, hit in the playground and blew up, and no one was hurt. And this is 1959? Yeah. And so at this point, are you feeling like you're, you're, you're invincible? If you fly a jet fighter... You feel invincible from day one because if you think of an accident, you think it's going to happen to the other guy, not going to happen to me. You have to have that mentality. What was it yes, like? I, you, I so, thought I was, so you thought you were invincible. I, what was it like on the, for people that don't know, which is everybody, I can almost guarantee listening to this. What was it like on the ground in, in Vietnam? Was there... Was there a lot of, you know, did you find yourself drinking more because of just what was happening around you? What the hell were you guys uh, doing to get through that? Well, our bar was open in the officer's club 24-7 because that's the only place we had to eat. And they kept the bar open. 
and the draw drinks were 25 cents. And there was just a lot of drinking. Uh, you'd come down from a mission and go in and have a martini and go in and have dinner. But, you know, we were always having parties and uh, get-togethers and doing crazy things. But uh, it wasn't just solid sitting down drinking and being remorseful because everyone was having a good time. Even if a guy got shot down, uh, you know, we felt sorry for him, but we went to the club and had a drink for him. You celebrated him. Well, not celebrated, just celebrated him. Okay. Celebrating, yeah. But you, you know, you can't, you can't worry about yourself flying an airplane because you. I've seen guys do it and then quit. Wouldn't do it. Because it was just too much, too much stress. Yeah. I was leading a formation one time coming out of Japan, going down to Okinawa, to do some training, and um, a guy caught on fire on takeoff, and I'm sitting there, I'm right on his wing, and I yell at him, eject, 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 you're on fire. He ejected and uh, got out of it, but he had burns on his wrist and his forehead and his face, and he never flew again. He said, I'm getting out of the Air Force. This is crazy. And so, what, do you, what do you think when you see him, you say, not me? Well, you don't think not me. You just know it. You just, it's, a, it's a belief. It's a feeling you have. Uh, no, I, I've witnessed a lot of things like that in the military, and I don't have time to cover them all. But I prayed for this guy because I didn't think he got, I didn't see him get out of the airplane. I saw the wings burn off. I saw it hit the ground and blow up and found out he did get out of it. He didn't eject. He unlet, did his lap belt, and the, when the wings burned off, it shot him out of the airplane. But I, was, one thing I want to, you know, I, as an alcoholic, I, I found myself, you drink enough, right? You're drinking around the clock. And the next thing you know, I'm drunk at work. Did did you ever have a situation where you're flying a, a fighter plane after drinking? I never drank during the week in my 30 years in the Air Force. I only drank on Friday and Saturday night at the officer's club. Except one night I'm in uh, Okinawa. I had to go fly F-101 down to go to the flight simulator. And they, uh, I was having dinner after having three or four martinis. I was going to be there all week. And they called me on the telephone and said, we're in a typhoon evacuation and we can't hang her your airplane. So you've got to fly it out of here to your code air base in Tokyo. And I'd already flown five hours that day and I was tired and had three martinis. And I went down to the flight line and put on a flight suit and pre-flighted that airplane in a blowing rain. I was soaking wet when I crawled in the cockpit. I lowered the canopy, started up, and headed toward the Yokota Air Base, and I got it to 28,000 feet, put the autopilot on, auto hold on, and I went to sleep for about 40 minutes and at about 600 knots. And I'm out over the sea of Japan, headed toward North Korea, and I get a call over emergency radio, and they ask me, who is this airplane? And I call them, and I said, I've, I've lost my navigation equipment. I lied. And I said, I want a radar vector to Yokota Air Base in Tokyo. And they gave me a radar vector. And I just barely made it there before I ran out of fuel. What's a radar vector? Pretty much like the, like they give you like like a like a trajectory? Yeah, they give you a heading. Okay. And then I, I said, I'm going to start a I'm gonna start a descent about 150 miles out so I could throttle back and save fuel. But I barely got on the ground with just enough fuel to land and had no more to go. You know, you have so many amazing stories, and I'm not, we're going to wrap up soon. I'm not going to. I'm going to let you get on with your day. Some of those stories, I, you know, one thing just doing research about you, I, I read about an incident. Your son came behind you and was also in the military, and and he he ran into some major problems. And you know, you you and it wasn't you know he had an accident, right? Well, he graduated from the U.S. Naval Academy. And uh, worked his way up to command the USS Greenville as the fast attack nuclear submarine. He was a very talented young man. He had 20 years, and he's commanding this super submarine. And uh, he was out in Hawaii, and he was told to take 16 civilians on board the submarine for a cruise who had donated a lot of money to move the USS Missouri from uh, Washington State down to Pearl Harbor. And he wanted to give these guys a joy ride. And he, he made emergency descent, emergency ascent, which you, you blow up and you just shoot up out of the water. And it hit a Japanese fishing boat. And it killed nine people. This happened February the 9th, 2001. 
and uh, it, it was devastating. He went from uh, having the best rated submarine in the Navy to being forced to retire. And uh, he got out of the Navy, wrote a book called The Right Thing, and went on a lecture tour, making a lot of money, talking about the accident and talking about his naval career. And he is now retired, living up in northwest Washington State, married, has two grandbabies, two of my great-grandbabies. <laughs> and... But he was, this, this is an interesting story, I think. I went out to uh, Hawaii during his board of inquiry. They were threatening to court-martial him. And I kept my mouth shut through the whole thing. Were you sober at the time or were you still drinking? I had been in AA uh, about 18 years, about 10 years. Okay. Oh, yeah, that's right, 2001. My bad. Okay. And, yeah, I'd been in AA 11 years. And I kept using AA on him, and I have ever since I've been in the program, and he knows I'm in it. And he knows my sayings, and he knows how I believe. But he was very angry, and uh, you can't blame him. He had known he, all he knew was the military as a kid in the Air Force, and then left Italy and went to the Naval Academy and went went right into the Navy. And to be told you got to get out after that accident, even though he was acquitted and not, it was not his fault. Yeah, that's tough stuff. Yeah, it's tough stuff, and he was very bitter. Very bitter, but he was on Oprah for a week for an, uh, an hour. He was on, uh, oh God, he was on every TV show you could be on being interviewed after that accident. But anyway, he was bitter. And just three years ago, uh, I'm visiting him, and we're sitting in a coffee shop, and he said, "Dad, I want you to know I remember everything you said to me that you've learned in AA." And he said, I don't know what just happened to me just this moment. He said, I feel God at this table. And I said, I do too, Scott. Oof. We stood up in this coffee shop and gave each other a great big hug. And his life changed immediately. And he has no anger. He has no fear. He's happily. I just got a video of him holding his two great his two little granddaughters. He's happy. And uh, I credit AA for that. What does it mean for you to leave the legacy, you know, to have this legacy? Uh, that, that it's, I mean, it's very clear. I, I know it in myself, just being around you in meetings and, and all the men you work with and sponsor and women too that, that you share time with. Uh, what does it mean for you to have that legacy all, all through AA and God? Well, it just it, it makes me feel like that's why I'm here on this earth. That's what God wants me to do. And like the first thing I read, I don't want credit for it, and I don't want to be God, and I don't want to. Sometimes somebody said, Dan, you really, really helped me. I said, no, no, I don't. I'm just telling you what I've heard in AA meetings and what I believe in. And I'm, you know, I just, I don't know. I've, lived, I've had a marvelous life. In Italy, when I lived in Italy for three years, I was in a movie with Marcello Mastriani and Burt Lancaster. <laughs> I had a big part in, had a big part in the movie, and good things like that. It what was the movie had, called? It's called La Pelle. La Pelle. Yeah, the Italian for the skin. Okay. It it flopped in the nineteen eighty <laughs> film festival over in Cannes, France. <laughs> it's really a bummer of a movie. <laughs> oh, you, you can get it if you. Google it, but it's, it's, it's the Italians would do anything to save their hide. And it's, it's really a bum movie. <laughs> what, what do you, t what do you tell? I mean, this is the, the beauty of, of it. You know, you, you, uh, had your hands on a counter, you know, uh, asking God to help you. And, and, you know, I know I crawled into my first rehab or and meeting and here we are laughing, sharing stories about sobriety. Uh, you know, how, how special is that to you, Th those moments you can have with another alcoholic on the other side of all this? That's what life's all about. That's right. Life is to be enjoyed. And to, if you read the big book, the bottom of page 43, there's a little paragraph. It says, once again, the alcoholic has no defense against the first drink. Neither you nor anyone else can keep you from drinking it. That defense has to come from a higher power. And step 11 says we get a conscious contact with God, and I have that conscious contact with God, and I feel it 24-7. I'm not bragging. It's just my life. It's just who I am. 
What do you tell, this is the last question I'm going to ask you, what do you tell somebody, uh, a, a newcomer or somebody that's been in and out that can't stay sober that asks you, you know, what should I do? Uh, the first thing I do is say you have to surrender. You have to give up. And what, when you surrender, all you're saying is I have to change. And the only way I can change is to come into AA, get a sponsor, I say the first 13 words of, our, of how it works, that's what's important. Rarely have we seen a person fail who has thoroughly followed our path. You've got to follow, find out what the path is and follow it or die. Yeah. I usually, it, add, I, usually, I usually add that or die. Well, then that's the thing. And coming from you, a guy with exper- life or death experience, you know, up at 35,000 feet or whatever, I mean, it, it, to, you you can put the put the – Put your arms around the fact that this is life and death too, and when you share that with somebody else, it's impactful. Well, it is. Well, it is life and death. Don't you agree? Oh yeah. I mean, I've seen too. I've been around for for one six or, or one third of the time you've been around, and I've seen so many people, so many, come in and and go out and die. Oh yeah. Yeah, uh, no doubt about. It. And the ones that stay, you know, I got a buddy who talks about, he says, you know, if you, if there's somebody that's coming in and out and, you know, my, a, a buddy of mine, a sober guy will say, hey, if you stay sober, he'll say it to the subject that keeps going in and out. We would bet, I would bet all my, my money on you, my life savings. He said, the moment you pick up a drink, I wouldn't bet anything on you. And it's that simple. Yeah. Yeah. Well, so I'm going to let you go. Any, do you, anything else you want to share with people? Anything else you, you know, I mean, you've dropped some gems here over the course of the past hour. Anything else you want to share with people? No, uh, just uh, AA is not only for alcoholics. AA is for any everybody that ever lived on this earth. Those 12 steps will change your life. It'll give, I'm teaching a Sunday school class the first Sunday in uh, January to a couples class where my wife and I go. About There will be about 100 people there on the importance of journaling. And I'm going to read a lot of my journal to these people. And I'm just trying to pass it on. Well, you pass it, you pass it on today, man. Well, and here's the thing. Here's one of the rewards. And this is reading out of my journal, Hazleton, day 25 January. I believe that complete surrender of my life to God is the foundation of serenity. God has prepared for us many mansions. I do not look upon this promise as referring to only the afterlife. I do not look upon this life as something to be struggled through in order to get the rewards of the next. I believe the kingdom of God is within us, and it can be enjoyed eternal life here and now. So I believe I'm in heaven right now. The, the, here, the here and now. So often yeah. I find myself just trying to get through this. to where, And it's like, where the hell am I going? Settle in. And look around you, enjoy everything that's, you know, you and I were in a meeting Sunday. Hey, just enjoy the breath that comes in. A guy said that. It's like, man, that's right. Yeah. I believe in the afterlife, but I believe in having it right here on life. <laughs> Why not? Have fun. I'm going to change your attitude. Colonel Dan, I thank you so much. I'm going to make sure you can, I, I'll send you a link to this so you can listen to it. Thank you, buddy. All right. Thanks, Colonel Dan. I appreciate your time so much. God bless. All right, God bless. Thanks. Thanks so much for listening to The Payoff with Pete. Once again, I'm Pete Souza. And of course, we are part of the Rogue Media Network. All kinds of good podcasts you can find at roguemedianetwork.com. And of course, you can find this podcast and all those other ones wherever you get your podcasts, iTunes, Spotify, other spots like that. This has been a Rogue Media Podcast.